Given the significant complexities as far as etiology and the expense of investigations of uh, an individual with DSD is considered, a structured approach of evaluation of DSD is extremely important to avoid unnecessary investigations on one hand while not missing important causes on the other. So the first question which should come into the mind is what really is a disorder of sexual differentiation? We need to understand that even individuals who have a normal external genitalia can still be DSD if that genital appearance is incongruous to their karyotype. So obviously if there is a typical case of genital ambiguity one would consider DSD but also consider DSD in any individual who presents with bilateral cryptorchidism. This could be a very severe manifestation of virilization and seen in the setting of congenital adrenal hyperplasia and the newborn period could be lethal because there will be a risk of salt wasting crisis or later on they can present with cyclical hematuria if this is a simple virilizing form or a 11 hydroxylase form. Pino's total hypospadia should be always be evaluated for a possibility of disorder of sexual differentiation. Any girl with primary amenorrhea along with inguinal swelling should always be considered a possibility that this could be a virilized form which uh, a male which has been so less levels of androgen action or production that has resulted in a female phenotype in this perspective. It's also important to understand is to not unnecessarily investigate for a cause of DSD, which could be because of prominent clitoris, particularly in the premature infants. The clitoral growth is completed by around 28 to 30 weeks of life, but the fat content is not increased. So as we observe in obese male individuals, the increased suprapubic fat causes an apparent micropenis or a small phallic size appearance. Just the contrary, in the preterm individuals, because there is no fat, this clitoris looks large. But it would be prudent to really measure the size of clitoris and if it is more than 10 mm, then we should be alarmed. Labial addition is particularly common in the first year of life and if there is addition without clitoromegaly, this definitely should not be confused with DSD and penile hypospadias are extremely common which should not result in significant evaluation as far as cause of DSD is concerned. So we should start off with detailed history particularly regarding pregnancy and exposure to any androgenic agents like progesterone, valproic acid or virilization in the mother is extremely important because that could give us a clue of possibility of aromatase deficiency, P450 oxidoreductase deficiency or the setting of a luteoma of pregnancy. Family history will give us a clue of consanguinity particularly in the setting of CH. Infertility, particularly in maternal aunts, may be an indicator of X-linked complete AIS because that will represent that it was actually the maternal uncles who ultimately because of the same situation were unable to have a male development developed presented with infertility. History of sibling death and DSD is important particularly for 21 hydroxyl deficiency. Salt wasting will indicate to 21 hydroxylase and other forms of CH. On examination, the most important aspect to look at is the presence of palpable gonads. Most palpable gonads, particularly if they are round and smooth, are testis. Rarely, if there is a globular structure or a glandular structure, this could indicate the presence of over testis. And sometimes there could be a prolapsed fallopian tube, which can cause a confusion. Mullein structures can be identified using a parectal examination or an ultrasound of the abdomen and because of the maternal estrogen effect, ultrasound are quite reliable as far as the identification of mullein structures in the first 3-6 to six months of life. Genital openings should be looked at whether there is a single urogenital opening or there are two separate openings and phallic size should be determined using a hard scale by pressing the suprapubic fat in the pubic symphysis region on the dorsal aspect by stretching 
penis to the point of resistance and if the phallic structure size is less than 2.4 or 2 cm it is considered to be micro penis while if clitoral size is more than 1 cm it is considered to be a clitoromegaly. The external genital appearance could then be rated from the Prada staging which basically rates from a normal female appearance to a normal male appearance into 5 categories wherein category 3 and above have a common urogenital opening followed by 5 would be a near a normal male appearance which will be there. It's also helpful to, add, to calculate the anogenital ratio which basically gives us the indication of the level of virilization. It is the ratio of distance between the anus and the posterior fascia and anus in the, post in the interior fascia the ratio is more than 0.5. It is indicative of a form of virilization. Identification of specific pointers for disease like hypertension in the setting of 11 or 17 hydroxyl deficiency, pigmentation and a large number of steratogenic pathway defects. And as we discussed, salt wasting in the setting of 21 hydroxylase, star and 3 beta HST. Skeletal displays here should point to the possibility of SOX9 defect, while a renal mass should raise the possibility of a Wilms tumor situation. Syndactyly is an important pointer towards smith lemley optis syndrome. The initial assessment should actually look into not only the medical aspects but also about the psychosocial aspects. So there should be a careful counselling, use of prudent words, avoidance of gender specific terms like he or she and usage of common words like phallus, gonads rather than penis or clitoris or testis or ovaries. Monitoring for sodium or potassium is extremely important to exclude salt wasting form. Karyotype should be assessed and this karyotype should be done in a 200 cell plate because of a high chance of mutacism. Because karyotype takes a long time to come, it may be prudent to actually do a fish for a SRY gene or a Y cell line. Often these facilities are not easily available, so a careful assessment of the presence or absence of gonads and morelian structure will really help us in the initial classification. So if the gonads are absent and morelian structures are present, this is a classical case of XXTSD and we need to exclude a possibility of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. If the gonads are present and there are no morelian structure, it means it's a XYDSD which we need to look at the various steroidogenic defects or resistance defects or in the setting of a gonadalogenesis. On the other hand, if we have both gonads and mullerian structures present, it would indicate a complex situation of either an AMH problem or an over-testicular form of DST. If the testes are also not there and mullerian structures are also not there, this will indicate that at some point of time testes were there and they were functional, which could have resulted in anarchia because of testicular regression or some form of testicular dysgenesis could be noted. As emphasized earlier, 200 cells should really be assessed as far as the chromosomes are concerned and by fish could be a reasonable way to go forward in the initial phase. Important to understand that there is a significant variation in the endocrine pattern which happens and in the first day of life there is a surge as far as the LH, FSH, testosterone level. So if you are measuring it in the first day, we can do a basal level or beyond around 6 to 12 weeks we can do a basal level but in between this period the levels are very low and therefore only HCG stimulated test wherein HCG is given with 1500 unit per meter square on day 1 and day 3 followed by measurement of three important uh, metabolites androstenedione, dione which is a marker of 17 beta hst testosterone for 5 alpha reductase deficiency and dht for androgen insensitivity syndrome can be measured at day 3 to day 6 it's important to remember that because of the effect of sulfation and errors in the chemiluminescence assay it is the GCMS or the gas chromatography mass spec based assays which will be more reliable in the newborn period. Another 
very important test to be done is 17 hydroxy progesterone which should ideally be done on day 3 of life because of the postnatal surge of 17 OHP. So now based upon these three investigations of 17 OHP, DHEAS and DOC, we can really classify X6GSD. The 17 OHP levels are very very high beyond 100 nanogram per ml. This is 21 hydroxy deficiency. Milder elevations in 17 OHP along with high DHEAS is suggestive of 3 beta HSD. While high levels of 17 OHP along with high DOC and hypertension indicates 11 hydroxy deficiency. While if there is a combination of this picture, one should always consider the possibility of a P450 oxidoreductase deficiency. The complication as far as assessment of XYDSD is more because there are many more etiologies. So three investigations to look at is androstenedione, testosterone and DHT. If all levels are low, we are dealing with a number of defects as far as the steroidogenic pathway is concerned. And then depending upon the situation, whether there is a uh, salt wasting or a hypertension, we can classify them into 17 hydroxylase or other forms like LSCG receptors, star 3 beta or side chain cleavage enzyme defect. On the other hand, the industry and ion levels are high with lower levels of testosterone and DHT. It is classical 17 beta HST 3 and the ratio for testosterone to industry and ion post HCG should be less than 0.8. If the endocrine ion levels are high along with testosterone levels but low DHT it indicates the possibility of 5-alpha reductase 2 deficiency. Typically the testosterone to DHT ratio is more than 10 in the setting of post HCG stimulation. If all levels are high this indicates the possibility of androgen insensitivity syndrome. Having said that there is a whole confusing picture and often biochemical parameters do not really give us the clue and unless there is a clear cut picture there may be confusion particularly about partial androgen insensitivity syndrome and 5-alpha reductase deficiency and in this regards now there has been a shift towards the next generation sequencing of all the potential genes which are involved as far as the development are concerned to really reach a diagnosis and particularly for X, Y, DSD it is a reasonable approach because the number of genes may be missed in this situation. So in this perspective, so in this perspective the initial aspect to look at in a child with the sort of sexual differentiation is to look at palpable gonads and muladen structures. If gonads are absent and muladen structures are present we are dealing mostly with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Look at 17 OHP and then DOC levels. If they are normal, then we should look at the possibility of maternal virilization in the setting of aromatase, POR or luteoma of pregnancy. If these causes are not found, this could be a rare situation of XXDSD because of a SRY or a SOX9 problem. On the other hand, if the gonads are there and the bullet structures are also there, then there is obviously a problem in either AMH production or action. If there is uh, no Mullerian structure, irrespective of whether the gonads are there or not, it means that gonads were there at some point of time and they produce the AMH or they are intra-abdominal. In this setting, if testosterone is high, one should look at dihydrotestosterone, which if the HCG stimulated ratio of testo to dihydrotestosterone is less than 10 is indicative of 5-alpha reductase deficiency and if it is high, suggestive of androgen insensitivity syndrome. On the other hand, if the testosterone levels is low, then we should look at the salt status with salt wasting form indicating star, NRA51 or SF1, oxidoreductase or 3 beta HSD deficiency and hypertension indicating 17 hydroxy deficiency. If there is isolated defect, then it is suggested to be LHCG receptor defect or a 17 beta HSD defect. Please visit our website learning.drosociety.in, the go-to place for pediatric endocrinology learning. Happy learning.